These are written that you may believe. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I noticed this especially this past weekend, but I'm sure you have noticed a similar phenomenon. When any big event happens, whether it be a controversial college basketball game ending, or a politician's statement, or a catastrophic event, there's almost this mad dash to uh, run to social media and make your opinion known. Everyone's got to have a take on something, and the bigger the event, the more takes and opinions there will be. Everyone runs to Facebook or Twitter and, and make sure they get their opinion out there. We're 2,000 years after the first Easter morning, and the takes have not died down. Everyone feels the need to have an opinion about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, about what happened that first Easter morning. And our gospel today kind of takes us through that first week, that first eight days, and lets us know about the various opinions that were forming, about those who believed, about those who doubted. Why did this matter? Why did this happen? People were wrestling with this cataclysmic event and how to make sense of it. Each year, Low Sunday, as this Sunday is sometimes called, we read the story of Doubting Thomas. A week after celebrating our Lord's resurrection, we encounter Thomas who was absent from that first appearance. And I think Thomas sometimes gets a bad rap. He was simply asking for the same proof that the other disciples were freely given. They were given proof of the senses, sight, in their case, as demonstration that this really was the man that they had been following. And Thomas was asking for proof of touch, another sense to really solidify that this was the same man he had been following around Galilee and Capernaum. This was the same person he saw feed the thousands and heal countless others. And so when we look at the figure of Thomas, we are obviously invited to think about doubt and belief or unbelief, about what to do about the resurrection, how to make sense of it, and importantly, how it changes our lives. This morning, I want to talk about unbelief. After all, that's what the gospel is about. Belief or unbelief or doubt shows up time and time again, but I want to focus on two kinds of unbelief that I think every Christian at some point in your life is going to struggle with. The first is an unbelief centered on the facts, not actually believing that what was claimed to have happened actually happened. The second one is an unbelief that this matters at all. And each of these kinds of unbelief need a different kind of antidote. And so I want to tackle both of them today to give us some ammo so that when these forms of doubt arise in our lives, we are prepared to fight back. We know what to do. So the first form of unbelief, that of denying the actual event, is, in my opinion, the easier of the two to combat. We have thousands of years of tradition, thousands of years of eyewitness accounts, and of people much smarter than me who have thought through these things and come to the conclusion that it is reliable. It is, uh, we have confidence to believe that Jesus Christ physically, bodily, really, historically rose from the dead that Easter morning. Nowadays, I think uh, this form of unbelief was maybe more popular 15, 20 years ago, where we even had clergy saying that the resurrection was a metaphor for love. It, it was spiritual, but he didn't physically rise from the dead. I think it's becoming less prevalent now, actually, but it, it still lingers in, in all of our lives. Did this really happen? Did he really walk out of that grave with his body? Luckily for us, I think we have every reason in the world to believe that this really truly happened. And I want to summarize some of the reasons that we have that confidence. When you think about the resurrection, non-Christians, Christians, philosophers, skeptics, everyone pretty much agrees that there are some facts that we have to deal with. The tomb was found empty. 
why it was found empty is, is what we're trying to get to. But the tomb was found empty. People claimed to have seen Jesus in multiple locations, hundreds of people at multiple different times. People claimed to have seen the risen Lord. And then lastly, the disciples, the core group, were radically transformed to the point where they were all willing to lose their life for belief that Jesus Christ actually rose from the dead. So we have those three facts that we're trying to figure out how do we best address these. The tomb was found empty. Hundreds of people claimed to have seen the risen Lord. And the disciples' lives were radically, radically transformed in the blink of an eye. Some skeptics will say something like, the disciples lied that Jesus had risen from the dead. They had a good thing going, and they didn't want it to end, and so they just lied about it and told everyone around them. He, he rose from the dead and started a religion about it. I'm sure you've heard this objection before. But anyone who thought that the disciples were lying could do what? They could march down to the tomb and point at the body of Jesus and say, see, they're lying. So the disciples' line does not explain that the tomb was found empty. And this same line of thinking could actually be applied to people who claim that the disciples were simply having hallucinations. It was someone they loved, and they couldn't bear the thought that he was gone, and so they hallucinated that he was back among them. But the same problem arises. Someone could take them to the tomb, show them the body of Christ in there, and then point them to a psychiatrist who can deal with their grief. Others will say that the disciples or someone else stole the body of Jesus, hid him somewhere else, which explains the empty tomb. And maybe they lied to the disciples about it. But it doesn't explain that hundreds of people saw the risen Lord in multiple times and multiple places. Hundreds of people all claim to have seen the risen Lord. Going back to the disciples' line, if the disciples stole the body of Christ, lied about it, it might explain the empty tomb. They might have lied about the appearances. But no one dies for a lie they know is a lie. When push came to shove, when the disciples were threatened, lose your life or save your life or go back on what you said, they're going to go back on what they said. Nobody dies for a lie they know is a lie. So the point is, is that all the objections people will raise, the various ones about lying or hallucinations, or even uh, people saying that he didn't actually die, he was just in a coma, then made his way out of the tomb three days later, none of them really explain all three of those facts. Some fail to explain the empty tomb. Some fail to explain people seeing Jesus Christ as a resurrected man, not an emaciated man who just stumbled out of a coma or the radical transformation of the disciples. The simplest explanation is that Jesus Christ really, truly, physically rose from the dead. That is what best explains all the facts. But it's the second form of belief, in my opinion, that I think is more sinister. It acknowledges all of this. It, it, it acknowledges that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That, that is a historical fact that we have confidence in but it rejects that it has any relevance in our life. We don't fix this type of unbelief with scholarly articles or more arguments about the resurrection. We don't fix this type of unbelief by pointing to a book or to a, a, a succinct argument. No, I think we fix this type of unbelief by doing what Thomas did. Father Steve and I, I know, have preached on this before, but if you read the story carefully, you'll notice that Thomas missed that first appearance, and then eight days passes before he sees Christ for himself. Eight days where he doesn't believe that the resurrection happened. Eight days where his head is full of doubts. And if he were like one of us, he probably would have packed up and gone home. I don't believe it. This isn't for me. I'll see you all later. But what does he do instead? He stays with the disciples. He stays in the church. He remains in prayer. He hears people talk about their lives that have been transformed. And although he hasn't had that experience yet, he trusts that it will happen when he places himself in community, in the body of Christ. 
He remains faithful in spite of his doubts. This second form of unbelief, I think, is so dangerous because it allows us to sit in the pews, content that I believe this, I think it actually happened. But it eventually leads to an apathetic faith, a lukewarm, stale spiritual walk that acknowledges all the facts, but treats it as if it is indifferent whether or not it actually happened. I think if many of us are honest, we view the resurrection at times, maybe like UFOs or extraterrestrial life. It might be true. It might not. But honestly, it doesn't really matter. It's not changing my day-to-day life in any way. If somebody told me they were real or that they weren't, my day is going to be the same. If someone told you the resurrection of Jesus Christ definitively did not happen, what does St. Paul say we should do? Pack it up and go home. Your faith is in vain, and you of all people are to be pitied. But we have confidence that it did happen. And because it happened, our lives will never be the same. The Easter season is designed to confront us with a historical reality that changes us forever. One day, every single one of us will die. The resurrection is not a proclamation of hope for an event that might happen, or even an event that likely will happen. It is a proclamation of hope for something that will happen to every single one of us. Our repentance and trust in Jesus Christ, our belief in his resurrection, is what will allow us to be resurrected alongside him. Every single time we say the creed, we make a connection between the resurrection and the final judgment. The third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Death comes for us all. One day we will face Jesus Christ on the judgment seat. But our belief in Jesus Christ, not just a belief in the facts, but a belief of the heart, is our hope in the midst of that judgment. I think the climax of John's gospel is not the empty tomb. I don't think that is the point he's building to. The empty tomb is proof that the resurrection actually happened. But I think Thomas's words are the pinnacle. My Lord and my God. Because it's in these words we see how the resurrection affects us personally. It changes things for you and for me. It allows us to not just say that God exists... But to look at Jesus Christ and say, that is my Lord and my God. John's closing words in this chapter are his purpose statement. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Believe that the resurrection actually happened. We have that confidence. But even more so, Believe that it changes your life, now and forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.